All right, y'all, welcome back to the show. It's Anti-War Radio. And now we've got a good interview lined up. Tom Woods, author of Meltdown, and Charles Goyette, author of The Dollar Meltdown. Both uh, hardcore libertarian, individualist, natural rights, radical types like myself. If you want to know a little bit about Charles Goyette, you can go to the American Conservative Magazine's website and read a great article he wrote a few years back called How to Lose Your Job and Talk Radio. Uh, he's a career radio guy, and uh, of course, he could have written How to Find More Jobs and Talk Radio. Now he's writing books, uh, including The Dollar Meltdown and a brand new one that's coming out about something about all you got to do is not be afraid and stop believing in the state and start believing in yourself and everything will be fine. Isn't that right, Chuck? Something like that, yeah. It's a. If- Funny that uh, it would take it, w- it would take uh, a book to help Americans wake up to the fact that there's some sort of correlation between liberty and prosperity, but that's why I'm forced to write it. Yeah, well, and good thing you are too, because as things break down worse and worse, people start looking in all directions for easy answers. And hey, being free and you know owning your own self and the things that you uh, you know accumulate voluntarily and whatever that's easy, and it's. Uh, a lot nicer than fascism, you know, which is the other option, apparently. So, yeah, anyway, the dollar meltdown uh, is the great companion to the regular meltdown, and we'll have Tom Woods on to talk about that. But let's start this interview off with David Broder's piece in the Washington Post yesterday, or was it the day before? Did you see that, Charles? Yeah, sure. All right, sure. so um, apparently it's uh the way he writes it geez it's kind of tough to say it or whatever but we all know it's true war is good for the economy and barack obama could save his presidency and in fact be one of the greatest presidents like lincoln or franklin roosevelt if he would only attack iran isn't that the syndrome that all the great presidents are are the biggest uh, warmongers but you know i'm i'm glad that uh, broder's taking some heat on this but I remember in 2003, in advance to, in the lead up to the uh, invasion of, of Iraq on on uh, uh, bogus grounds, I remember watching uh, Larry Kudlow, Lawrence Kudlow on, uh, I guess, CNBC or whoever he's on, uh, talk about how good that the uh, war would be for the stock market. Hasn't quite worked out that way for us now, has it, Larry? And uh, I remember William Seidman, who was a distinguished uh, dean of uh, one of the business schools, the big business schools, and I believe became uh, the uh, head honcho in charge of the uh, FDIC and probably the FSLIC during that period of the uh, savings and loan problem. And he said effectively the same thing, oh, the war would be uh, good for the economy. Didn't quite work out that way now, Bill, did it? Where do these people come up with this stuff? Well, it's just that they see in the very short term. And, in fact, the Bush years, everybody was getting rich, staying home. A lot of people were quitting their jobs and just living off of their house. Yeah. Refinancing it and going and buying a new car. And then I want to call everybody's attention to a great piece by Karen Kukowski on uh, LouRockwell.com asking, you know, why is Jonah Goldberg still alive? That's effectively what (laughs) the... Is that on Lou Rockwell today? Yeah, tell that story. Yeah, well, we talked about this on the show yesterday. Glenn Greenwald's got a great piece about it as well. Um, Jonah Goldberg, uh, the son of Lucy Ann Goldberg, is his only you know achievement in life or whatever, the lady from the Lewinsky scandal back in the day. And uh, he's a guy that taught us the Ladine Doctrine. Uh, America, every 10 years or so, needs to take a crappy little country and slam it up against the wall and shatter it to a million pieces just to prove that we're tough guys and whatever. And he's saying that... Um, I don't know if he's specific about, you know, whether it should be enemy combatant status or or what, but he's basically saying that the military and or the CIA ought to find Julian Assange and kill him. And, in fact, uh, I think we established yesterday on the show he uses a slang for piano wire around the neck. And so, never mind law, this guy is an enemy of the state. And now, Charles, oh, it was Dan Ellsberg who explained that uh, that was the proper euphemism there. Um, uh, Charles, all, all Assange is supposedly guilty of doing is leaking the truth to the people of the world about how the wars are being conducted. That's all. He hasn't, uh, you know, sided with Saddam Hussein, and not like he's an American could be guilty of treason anyway, but he hasn't done anything that's an overt act on behalf of a foreign power. It's generally acknowledged. What he's doing is just giving the truth to whoever can download it, which is WikiLeaks.org. It amazes me how very, very uh, touchy, how very, very sensitive uh, 
all of these warmongers are about uh, about people discovering the truth. If the cause is, is so noble, if the cause is so uh, so justified, if the uh, if the uh, the demand for the war is uh, is so meritorious, what are they afraid of letting people know what it is that is actually going on? Well, and people can find Jonah Goldberg. It's on the internet, and Google will keep it forever in that cache somehow. Um, they can find Jonah Goldberg saying, hey, look, I would go fight, except that, you know, I have a wife and a kid and a life that I'm leading here, and I'm getting paid a lot of money to write my crappy articles about why you and your kid ought to go die in this thing. And so I'm sorry, I can't be bothered. I, he just goes ahead and explains. This war is for you. This is for me to promote and for you to go die in. And get no, diagnosed a, with a personality disorder. He got that from uh, Dick Cheney, who had other priorities when it was his chance to be a, a, a real life instead of a virtual warmonger. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so now let's talk uh, like specifically about the uh, economic fallacy. Well, I guess maybe we'll have to wait till the break. But, you know, Broder's really getting at something there, isn't he, Charles, when he says war is good for the economy because this is the narrative. I learned this as a little kid, and it's basically everybody knows, kind of, I think, that, you know, in the same way America's a good guy or whatever, that – FDR and the New Deal were doing great things to solve the problem of the Great Depression, but that what it really took was World War II and all those factories kicking into gear to build those planes and tanks and ships, and that's what saved us from the Great Depression. Everybody kind of knows that. It's the consensus. So everybody learns in their government school, and that's what David Broder didn't cite anything. That He was just reaching for the everyone knows there. Uh, and so why wouldn't you know war with Iran be good for the economy if it would mean the production of more fighter planes and bombs and whatever and screw them Persians anyway, right? Yeah, it was so good for the state. Uh, the, the, that's what it was good for. It was the health of the economy or the prosperity of the people. It was good for the health of the state. It allowed the state to be in a position to command uh, the, the lives of uh, the American people, all the resources uh, of the American people. Of course... Of course, when you put millions of men under arms, of course, the unemployment rate is going to go down. <laughs> I mean, that we all found be... a job. We'll you... go to prison if we don't volunteer. Well, you could take uh, Keynes at, at his word, and, and you could uh, draft, you could conscript millions of men to go out and dig holes in the earth and put uh, bottles of paper money in them and bury them and then dig them back up. I suppose if you wanted to just keep keep people doing something either destructive or that produces uh, absolutely not, of course unemployment went down. But it really wasn't until the end of the war that we had a recovery, and we had a recovery because the military spending collapsed. The American people were able to start keeping their money, mm -hmm. investing their money, saving their money, forming capital, and it was then, only at the end of the war, that the economy recovered. Mm -hmm. All right, we're talking with Charles Goyette. Santa War Radio, Tom Woods is going to be joining us. And we're going to get back to where we started here with why it looked like everybody was making money and things were prosperous during the first decade of this century, Charles. And uh, and then, you know, you were saying to Cudlow and the rest of these guys didn't work out that way, but I'm going to make you prove that causation when we get back. All right, y'all, welcome back to the show. Santa War Radio. We've got Charles Goyette on the line, and now we're joined by Tom Woods. Goyette is the most famous radio host in the world and a former partner at Anti-War Radio. If you uh, just search antiwar.com for Goyette, you'll find a lot of great interviews in the Anti-War Radio section, though it's been a long time and we miss you very much, Charles. Uh, Tom Woods, of course, is from the Mises Institute. He wrote a million billion awesome books. Uh, two of them are Nullification. That's the most recent about how the states ought to stand in between uh, citizens whose rights are being violated and the national government which most routinely violates them and uh, also is the author of Meltdown a free market look at why the economy tanked etc and now the way I look at it is this Tom Woods book Meltdown is about how we got to where we were at the end of 2008 and Charles's book The Dollar Meltdown is the perfect companion it's the next one on your list uh, they both go together uh, just like peas and carrots, and it's about the dollar meltdown, the crisis, the crack-up boom that we are headed towards as uh, the government continues to create money out of thin air in order to stimulate digging holes in the ground and burying bottles full of paper money or whatever, bombing people to death in Pakistan. So um, 
that's uh, my plug for y'all's books and, and my explanation of y'all's credentials on this subject, both y'all uh, Mesians, Austrian economic types. And now, uh, so, uh, Tom, I'll fill you in. Before the break, we were talking with Charles about um, the empire, and the, especially this first decade of the 21st century and the war on terrorism and the trillions of dollars that have been spent and um, the idea that this is good for the economy. And, and he was laughing and saying, yeah, well, how's that working out for you? But it seemed like while we were at war, things were great. In fact, as soon as the Sunni, the Sunni awakening uh, broke out, in Iraq is uh, right around the time the economy started doing bad, and so, you know, maybe we do just need more war. I want to hear uh, the causation uh, to this correlation. Yes, we're broke. Yes, wars are expensive, but isn't that good for, you know, stimulating aggregate demand and that kind of thing? Well, if that were true, then you would think that when World War II, you know, the big one, as Archie Bunker used to say, uh, when you'd think that when that one ended, given all the spending involved there, then we should have conversely fallen into a terrible depression because of the federal budget being cut by two-thirds very dramatically and suddenly. And yet, to the contrary, what we got was that the year 1946 being the best, most robust year the private economy has ever seen bef uh, since then and before then. And in ev every year of all American history, there's not one that compares with 1946 in terms of productivity. I mean, 30% production increase in one year. I mean, it's just never, we've never had that kind of result before. And yet we had, from 1943 onward, the usual suspects among the economics profession warning precisely that we would indeed fall into depression if, if uh, the spending were simply discontinued. In fact, Alvin Hansen, who was the best-known disciple, American disciple of Keynes, actually said in 1943, well, look, you know, when the war ends, we can't just disband the army and stop building ships and and lift all the economic controls well you know what alvin that's exactly what we did do we did do all those things we didn't have to carry out your crazy idea that we should continue building ships for a war that already ended we actually just stopped doing that and the result was that the economy adjusted so it's not like if the government doesn't spend the money nobody will spend it no people get the money back and they spend it employing each other but providing useful goods and services. You can, in fact, survive without the government blowing all this money on the military-industrial complex. And I would add, by the way, that it was a relatively common Cold War uh, complaint, or, or observation, rather, among Marxists that, in fact, the U.S. economy would indeed plunge into the doldrums if it weren't for this constant spending stream on the military. Well, that that's, that's just dead wrong whether it's coming from a Marxist or a right Keynesian like uh, David Frum or whoever it is, they're all wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, Tom, right, doesn't now, that I mean just, that... Hold, that it, hold mean it right that, there uh, one second, Charles. Hold, it, hold right. it right there one second. I just interviewed this guy from the Los Alamos study group about uh, the insane boondoggles in the nuclear weapons industry and the so-called SDI and this, all this madness. Uh, bazillions of dollars thrown in a, in a black hole. And yet... Charles, it seemed like everybody was getting rich during the worst part of the war on terror. Why? If all of this is clearly just a net loss, as you and Tom have both claimed so far. Well, uh, let, let's start with the purchasing power of the dollar and all the money that you saved during the Bush years. The dollar lost 20% of its purchasing power to, during that time. Does that matter to anybody? Yeah. Does, uh, does the fact that uh, the prosperity was the result of... Uh, uh, the money supply and credit conditions uh, being uh, pumped up to sky-high realms by the Federal Reserve uh, matter. Well, it might look good to you at the time, but we are suffering the consequences of it now with the mortgage meltdown. You, it, does, it, does it matter that, uh, that, that the cost of living in the United States is about ready to, to literally explode perhaps as early as the next quarter? I'm looking right now at a chart that uh, specifies commodity price increases. I mean, these are underlying commodities, not the food you buy at the grocery store, but the underlying commodities. Over the last 12 months, wheat up 74%, corn up 14%, oats up 68%. You're looking at uh, prices of, of basic food commodities up something like 48% over the last year. Energy costs up 23% on average over the last year. So all of these things, you know, it's sure, you can... 
you can uh, give your kids all of that Halloween trick-or-treat candy and have them bouncing off the wall for a few hours, and it looks like, gee, they're really strong, active kids. Look at that. Look at that sudden burst of energy, and then they collapse dead to the world, and they sleep through dinner. And it's the same with college kids that, you you know, you ramp them up on a couple of uh, uh, triple uh, espresso double mochas, and uh, they stay up all night to study for finals, and they fall asleep at 3 in the morning, and they miss their 9 o'clock final. I mean, it, all of this all of this seeming prosperity was at the cost of something, and the costs are coming home to roost, as they say, right now. But I wanted to ask Tom if, uh, in, in the face of the uh, wonderful 1946 and subsequent recovery in the United States, if all of those guys like Alvin, who you discussed, and the others, the uh, the other Keynesians and uh, Marxists, didn't throw themselves off a bridge, you would think they would at least resign their positions or modify their point of view. But no, they they double down on it. They cling to it all the more strongly, even though they're staring in the face of the most vivid refutation of what they teach imaginable. And Scott, what you were saying about all the waste and everything. I mean, I've been writing about this for quite some time. I mean, you look at the money that... Leave aside the money that's spent on prostitutes and outright bribes in the military-industrial complex. Just look at, you know, the F-22 and some of these crazy projects that just absorb all this money. Submarines. I mean, are we really so short-sighted that we think that if we... My gosh, if we ever took that money away and spent it on something productive, well, the economy would just tank. It just can't be so. And moreover, I think the alleged prosperity that we observed during the war uh, had nothing not that to do it's with, over, it but with the people will think of it that way well. anyway. That the worst part of the Iraq War is over, for example. Right, uh, but I don't think I wouldn't say that because the worst part of the war is over. Therefore, that's where the economic collapse came from. I think the war it's entirely adventitious that we happen to have the war and we happen to have. Um, a period about of apparent prosperity. I, I don't think there's a real connection there. I think it's the, the Federal Reserve is, is, is creating the phony prosperity. And yet, I mean, sure, you can temporarily get some phony prosperity from a war, but of course, again, it's phony. I mean, we could get phony prosperity building a lot of totally useless things, but once we're all done building those useless things, how, how are we any better off? But then we, we still haven't solved the underlying problem of how to deploy human beings and resources in that configuration that will best satisfy the needs of human beings. And all of the money that you had to borrow to uh, build the useless things or to pursue the, uh, the, uh, the, the phonied up war has to be paid back. It has to be loaded on the backs of little children who will never have the kind of lifestyle that we've enjoyed in this country because they'll be paying back our present consumption. Oh, no, but I'm an American. I just refuse to believe that, Charles. You're just one of these doomsayers. Things are getting better. The economy's recovering, and... And I, I won't believe that the kids are going to grow up in a third world America. It just can't be. We'll be right back. It's Anti-War Radio. All right, World Empire and the Business Cycle Theory. Anti-War Radio. I got the great Tom Woods and the heroic Charles Goyette on the line. And now here's my take, guys, on this whole war and the bubble thing. Is that uh, the dot com thing was a big bubble and that was all crashed in 2000. And Bush made a big deal about, hey, I'm inheriting this recession from Clinton. And uh, all the talk was we got to prevent a double dip recession. We got to keep inflating. And of course, we got Y2K scarce, so we need to make sure that there's plenty of cash for every ATM so that we don't have runs and panics on paper currency. Uh, so they cranked up the amount of paper currency. I don't know exactly how big of an effect that had. And then September 11th happened. Not only did it happen, it happened at downtown New York. And so that was extremely problematic for the financial markets. And it, basically at that time, all things being equal, America was due a severe recession, a correction, they call it, in saner times. But instead, and I remember the first GM commercials was like a really low camera shot headed down the highway, and we're America, and we're united, and we're standing strong, and now in cooperation with the Citigroup, we're doing 0% interest rates. Everybody go into debt. So now, at that point, the double dip recession didn't happen, even though a massive attack, and we needed a recession anyway, everybody started getting really rich at 0% interest rates. So now I want the two of you masters to explain to me how exactly that works in terms of, uh, you know, you guys' understanding of the business cycle and because it seems to me like it's the business cycle interrupted, but maybe they can do that. So either which one of you, I'll take it away. I guess Charles said, uh, Tom, you start. Okay, I'll, I'll try and do a, 
a quickie version of this. But uh, first yeah. of all, do you agree with my premise there? The, the way I set that up, that that's basically about right. That that uh, that in 2001, we, we America was due a severe recession, and instead they got out of it by yeah, cranking yeah, down the exactly, interest rate. I, I take that exactly that approach in uh, in meltdown. That's exactly my thesis. And and for papering it over, Alan Greenspan got the the moniker the maestro. Like, how did he do this? Well, you know, it's actually not that difficult to see. Basically, the long and the short of it is this. And you know, anytime people hear the the words interest rates, their eyes glaze over and they think, ah, I got to switch the station. But you can't. You can't. I mean, you, this is the prosperity of the world rests in the balance here. So it's very important to get this. It's very simple. Is that when you have somebody like Alan Greenspan or Ben Bernanke running the Federal Reserve, they have the ability to fiddle with interest rates. And it's not like interest rates are just some arbitrary number and, you know, life would be perfect if we could just force them down to some low number. They, they play a role. Like any price, they play a role. They're not arbitrary. But if you force them down thinking that you can bring about free prosperity by this means, what in fact you wind up doing is discombobulating the market completely and, and leading to all kinds of decisions being made that wouldn't be made otherwise, that there are certain lines of production that suddenly become much more profitable, and that they're typically lines of production that are the most interest rate intensive. And so particularly when you look at this recession, it's not just housing that did really badly. Particularly hard hit also were uh, raw materials, mining, all these things took particularly disproportionately hard hits. These are the things that because it takes them a long time to actually bear fruit because they are long-term production, well, when you lower interest rates, that, that makes those things all the more profitable because those things take a long time. They're going to involve long-term borrowing. And when interest rates come down, that disproportionately helps long-term borrowing. So long-term production projects tend to get started. Interest rate-sensitive production projects tend to get started. But those are projects that the free market would normally have been had been dampening down. The free market would normally have been saying, now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now is not the time for everybody to be engaged in these sorts of projects. The long-term funding for them isn't going to be there. The people aren't willing to save enough and defer enough consumption to make possible the completion of all your projects, so now's not the time to do that. The market is trying to put a break on this, as Hayek said, that the interest rate is supposed to be a break. But when, when the lights are supposed to be yellow or red, the lights are all green under the Federal Reserve with, with the low interest rates. Just go ahead. Yes, yeah, sure, expand, expand, expand. But eventually reality catches up, and the exact mechanisms of how this all works, you can find out by I put together a little resource page learnaustrianeconomics.com, where you can listen to audio and watch video or get articles and find out exactly how this all works. But that's the basic bottom line, is that you, you, you have the economy put on a kind of a sugar high for a little while, and then eventually reality sets in. We realize, wait a minute, we have, as a group, collectively made the wrong production decisions with our resources, and now the economy is a totally discombobulated mess that needs to be completely reconfigured so that we are producing the right things in the right quantities in the right proportions at the right time. And the only way that can be done is through the decentralized mechanism of the price system and entrepreneurs um, appraising various projects and deciding what is a real project that's really going to bear fruit and what is just a bubble project that needs to be discontinued. Well, and, and then... The driving force behind that is the president needs to be able to invest the entire nation in an unsustainable project, like, say, a bonus extra war on top of the one that somebody had coming. Charles? Yeah, that would be, that would be really, really wise, and that's part, of, uh, that's part of where we are. Look, I ditto everything that, that uh, Tom said about it. Um, I used the example in the dollar meltdown of the, in the olden days when the, when the pirates would erect uh, false lighthouses in the middle of the night, create a big old bonfire as though that was the location of the uh, the lighthouse, and it would lure seamen and merchant ships to uh, to the shoals that they'd crack up and wreck on. And by the same token, the Federal Reserve does this by uh, j- j- jerry-rigging around interest rates, manipulating interest rates, creating uh, false signals to the business community about uh, uh, about business conditions and about uh, uh, future prosperity, the availability of money. And, and about so, Saddam's relationship with Osama. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, if you 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 know, you can't do better than uh, than forging uh, war documents. That's 
that's even better than erecting false lighthouses. Uh -huh. Well, and the reason why I say that you guys' books are twin brothers here, uh, the meltdown and the dollar meltdown, is because uh, whereas Tom's book is about this is what happened to us, your book's thesis really is about here's where we're headed because what's the Federal Reserve doing right now? Instead of letting us have that correction, just like we talked about happened 10 years ago, uh, they're doing the same game again, and they're creating more and more and more money. And, Charles, in your book, you're saying at some point this stops working and that some point is soon. Well, look, gold is a good indicator. Gold always sets up shop at the crossroads of history, and uh, that's why it's giving signals that we're in for a monetary crisis now. Gold at 1356, it just keeps making new highs. It's it's trying to warn people It it is actually – um, the best thing possible to get people's attention that there is a problem, there is an underlying problem with the irredeemable, the fiat paper money, not just here in the United States, but globally. The whole world is tarping, is deficit accommodating, is quantitatively easing, and all paper currencies, there are no redeemable currencies around the world, all paper currencies uh, are, are, um, are, are going to have a day of reckoning, and gold is signaling that right now. Now, before the break, you said that the people listening now, that their kids are not going to live in the same kind of civilization that we've known. How drastic are you talking about the changes that we're facing here? Well, I'm afraid it's very, very drastic, and I you certainly don't want to be uh, deemed uh, some sort of a doomsayer. I'm trying to say, look, the world has been through these things. This isn't our first currency crisis rodeo. The world has been through these things, and they always end very, very badly, and there's a great deal of pain and suffering and uh, uh, dislocation involved. Um, so the debts have been loaded on the backs of little children for present consumption, and um, those debts will have to be repudiated in one form or another. I mean, it's it's simply uh, not believable that, that people who are not even born yet will be willing to uh, constantly throughout their lives carry the burden of uh, the wastrel uh, behavior of the United States government during our era. It's not going to happen. So the debts will be repudiated in one form or another, and whether it's by a slow-motion repudiation of uh, depreciation of the currency – um, and, and so uh, people get their Social Security checks 10 years down the road, but it's not enough to fill up the gas tank or to buy a, uh, buy a hamburger. That may, be, that may be how it's uh, repudiated. But by one form or another, all of the people in the United States that are dependent on government and have relied upon promises from the government for things like uh, deposit insurance and, and uh, medical benefits coming down the road and so on will find themselves uh, being left behind. Tom, do you think... And, and you're a real historian, too. Um, does it look to you like the empire is going to be the last thing to go after they take every last promise away from everybody they made them to? I don't know. I mean, Karzai, I've, I've the heard that very argument. last benefit of the American tax dollar. I've heard that argument, but on the other hand, I mean, if we really get to a point where Granny's having her life support unplugged, and it's a choice between that and keeping the troops in Japan, you know, I uh, maybe people might fall, you know, you know what backwards into making the right choice out of those two choices. Hey, let me let me mention Scott, I looked at the uh, the Heritage Foundation proposal for the budget on the future of America, proposal to cut 343 billion dollars from spending and it leaves untouched the costs of war and empire. It's unbelievable. And these these are the marching orders for most of the establishment or what Tom calls the plastic republicans. And you know, uh, I was thinking uh, I care so little about the stupid elections. I, I have trouble paying attention to them, but I know that this guy Jim DeMint poses as some kind of tea party this, that, and he's a star of uh, the article written by my previous guest about the nuclear industrial complex and the bribery, and this is a guy who pushes for full-scale strategic defense initiative, Star Wars, an impenetrable umbrella over North America that would repel 10,000 nuclear missiles or whatever, uh, unlimited spending on this absolute joke of a not even, couldn't even be a comic book, the ridiculous uh, plan for these, uh, I mean, look, Gordon Prather taught me, the only way to take out incoming nukes is with hydrogen bombs in space, not by shooting them with, you know, single rockets or whatever. The whole thing is just about stealing. And, uh, you know, this is supposedly the good guy Republicans, the new reformed uh, Tea Partiers or whatever, and, and they're just as bad as anything else. But um, I don't know. Tom, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. So go ahead and say something smart now. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I hope you're not going to call on me to talk about 
the folly of the SDI thing, uh, because you know a million times more about it than I do. But all I all I know is I remember growing up in the 80s thinking that you'd have to be some kind of a commie not to support this, right? I mean, this is the greatest <laughs> thing ever. And then, you know, you sober up, you read some stuff about it, and you realize that this is like the greatest boondoggle imaginable. I mean, it's like everything government does. Is that they take some crazy, impossible goal, and that's their favorite kind of goal, precisely because it can never be reached, then the gravy train is infinite. You know, I mean, the government, they're going to make everybody equal. They have all these nice-sounding things that you learn from fourth grade, none of which could possibly be done, because every attempt to do it leads to a different form of, of, of inequality. I mean, like the, um, the, the, the uh, Robert Nozick example of everybody likes Will Chamberlain, Chamberlain wants to watch him play basketball. So suppose we all had an equal amount of money, and then everybody pays 25 cents to go see Will Chamberlain play basketball. Well, now suddenly he is, is unequal, right? I mean, he's got all this money that we don't have. He's got a zillion dollars. So what does that mean, that now we have to intervene again and have him give back the 25 cents to everybody else? I mean, it's a goal that can't possibly be reached. That's why they love it. Well, and they something even like train FBI, people to talk which like is based that, on too. a faulty technical premise, that's why they love it. Yeah, and they always train everybody to talk like that, too. Nobody ever gives anything. Everybody's always giving back something, as though nobody ever just honestly earned what they had in the first place. Yeah, I, 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 that, that expression, I, that he gave something back or we got to give back, it, yeah, it, it's got totalitarian premises. Like, I, I owe them something after all they've done to yeah, me. Yeah, of course, everyone just means the state anyway. Right, right, right. The representative right, of, of everyone. But I remember the smart thing that I was going to say, and that is that, you know what, we're just a couple of months away from uh, what will again be the greatest speaking tour on behalf of individual liberty ever, and that will be Ron Paul's next campaign for the presidency, right? And it's just going to be uh, just around uh, 20, the beginning of 2011. And then this whole thing is going to start again, and it's going to start from, you know, 7 on the scale of 1 to 10 compared to where it started before. And, you know, he announced his candidacy on the Washington Journal on C-SPAN at 6 o'clock in the morning, uh, you know, uh, East Coast time uh, before. But now we're already, uh, we've had this whole thing where it didn't work out, but everybody saw that he was right this whole time. You have all these kids who are interested in Austrian economics now. I saw, or I think you posted Tom and Lou Rockwell's blog, this massive audience that turned out at a university to hear Ron Paul give a speech just the other day. And so whether he wins or not, uh, there are going to be a lot of millions of minds change coming up in just a couple of years, huh? I'm right to be excited, right? Uh, Charles, you want to take that one? Well, I I hope so. It's sure to it's sure to be hoped. To look at the uh, I think that um, people since this is election day mentioned something about the uh, the Republican groundswell that uh, we have been told about that's supposed to be taking place today. People are going to end up being very very bitterly disappointed by that if they expect anything from it. I mean. I referred the other day to the, the Republican Pledge to America. These guys came out and said that they will save. This is how serious they are about addressing the, our, our uh, economic and financial problems in this country. They said, here's what we will do. We will save $100 billion in the first year. And, and I, I laughed, and I thought, they can't be serious. This is like a setup. It's a one-two punchline thing. No, that's it. We're going to save $100 billion in the first year. Well, hell, a 1% increase in the interest rates would cost more than that. So I went, I went to the Treasury website. You can go to the Treasury Debt to the Penny website. They made their, they made their pledge to America on September 23rd, and I said, okay, I'm going to mark the, the U.S. debt, the visible portion of the U.S. debt to the penny, and it's $13.6 trillion and so on. I'm going to mark it to the penny and find out how much longer before the, uh, the visible national debt has grown by another $100 billion. It was a week later. One week, and and this this is what they're they're going to cut in the first year alone. Look, they're they're not going to be able to uh, override an Obama veto, so they're not going to repeal Obamacare. And besides, there's too much lobbyist money waiting at the end of the pipeline for a new variation, a Boehner Care variation on it. So they're not going to do um, anything that is really substantial or or serious. And um, I, I it is to be hoped that a quarter or two into this new Congress, the American people will realize, look, these are the guys, the Republicans and Democrats, these are the guys that sold us the map that, that marched us into this slew of bankruptcy, that marched us into this, into this swamp. Why are we buying another map from them to find our way out? And then maybe the Ron Paul campaign will be right there ready, and it will be, a, as they say, a perfect storm. 
I mean, you think about the crash of September 2008. If that had been in September 2007, imagine how things would have been different with one guy up there who knows economics and then John McCain recommending he ought to try Reed Adam Smith or whatever. I mean, I think he could have maybe. Well, John McCain has such a, for that. John McCain has such a tin ear. I watched him on uh, Friday um, camp- campaigning for Sharon Engel in Las Vegas, and he went up there and he said, Sharon Engel – will uh will will change America Sharon Engel represents hope and I thought wait a minute wait a minute I I winced and I said are you going to do this hopey changey thing uh, uh all over again <laughs> it's yeah, hey, it's been 2 years I completely forgot about all those people the republicans tortured to death and how bankrupt they made us all <laughs> 2 years is a long time in politics I'm pretty sure everything's different yep I read a Matt Taibbi article about the Tea Party and I'm convinced that real change is coming now yeah. All right. Well, All anyway, right. Uh, so Tom Woods, Charles Goyette, any final words about uh, Empire and paper money and uh, maybe uh, why and or how people can understand these things better? Well, I would just say that both of them are things that the establishment takes for granted. Uh, you know, you know if, if, you, if, if you question either one of them, you're considered to be a kind of crazy, you know, maybe you have some kind of mental problem, you need, need to be evaluated by a personality a disorder, yeah. I mean, like, you get that. So that should make you suspicious. Like, any time Henry Kissinger says there's something wrong with you, you have to assume you're on the right track. <laughs> so I, I would say that for those out there who are against the empire but see no problem with paper money or vice versa, <laughs> I mean, they, they go together. Because just ask yourself this question. Under what type of monetary system is the regime, is the empire, able to siphon more resources from private people like you and me, uh, one in which the amount of those resources is fixed, relatively fixed, or one in which they can just endlessly multiply the circulating medium? I mean, the question answers itself. So the money machine has to be tamed before you can successfully counter the war machine. That kind of brings us full circle where we started that uh, war is the is the health of the state. And my fear, of course, is that the more severe the uh, the economic crisis becomes, the more troubled we are domestically. The the at least the predictable syndrome is that the uh, the governing classes begin to find a to try to find a way to deflect blame from themselves to find somebody to point to to uh, divert the attention of the people and to keep the uh, the a who's all uh, stirred up and and anxious and. Uh, and then another war gets uh, gets cooked up in the in the depths of the Pentagon or the American Enterprise Institute or someplace. Yeah, well, and that's easy enough. And the thing is, too, is that there are scary people that live just one neighborhood over from you who seems to work pretty well, too. And that's what really worries me is that everybody is so anxious, but they don't really, you know, they all went to government schools and, and watch TV news. They don't have any real context for the shape of things. And they're so willing, at the behest of power, to blame people who have no power. And witness, obviously, the uh, uh, you know mosque bogus controversy dreamt up by you know the 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 lowest rung of the neoconservative movement. I mean, Pamela Geller and and Frank Gaffney and these most horrible, like most ridiculous, least credibility having people among those who read, and yet they're able to whip up an entire Tea Party movement, divert them away from accountability for whoever gave the money to the bankers back during the bailout of 08 to, uh, you know, picking on their next door neighbor who has no power whatsoever under the fear that he's going to take over their court system somehow or something. I don't know. You mean that those... Those uh, those those war fomenters like uh, Gaffney and Ken Edelman and so you mean they haven't heaved themselves off a bridge? No, afraid not. Not after all this time. And in fact, they have just as much power and influence as ever. It's sort of like the Iraq War. Everybody on TV had to keep agreeing that the whole thing was patriotic and great and whatever for years and years, at least till after Katrina. And then it was like, well, what are we going to do? All fire each other and replace ourselves with Eric Margulies and Charles Goyette and all these people who got it right? Not a chance. So come on, guys. Let's just keep pretending that everybody thought what we were doing was right and and just go on from there. Same thing with the economy. I keep during the show most days uh, MSNBC on in my peripheral vision, and there's Alan Greenspan's wife doing the news all morning long on MSNBC. (laughs) 
I mean, come on, you can make that up. You know, uh, Diane Feinstein, the senator, her husband uh, is, I forgot the name of it. Uh, his name is Richard Bloom, and he owns this company that's like the Democratic Bechtel or whatever, instead of George Schultz, the Republican. It's, you know, he's in bed with the Democrats more, I guess. Um, but you look at it the other way around. It's like, here's this guy whose job is following the army around, uh, building military bases for them at, you know, more than they cost. And his wife sits for the sen- sits in the Senate for him. Like this is actually the imperial court, the 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 Senate of the United States of America, where the wives of military contractors sit and vote for more money for more wars, right in front of all of our faces. Where the wife of the central banker reads the news in the daytime. That's pretty strange, Scott. I like it. All right. Well, anyway, I'm just hectoring y'all both now, but. Uh, thanks very much for y'all's time on the show today, both of you. Always glad to be here, Scott. Good to talk to you, Scott. Thank you. I'll see you. All right, y'all. So that is Tom Woods and Charles Goyette, Meltdown and the Dollar Meltdown, TomWoods.com, CharlesGoyette.com. Buy their books. Read them both. And that's Anti-War Radio for the day.